been introduced at all for anything, so <laughs> this is a <laughs> new experience for me. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak, and I, I thank the Dean and, and Altus, and it's good to see a lot of familiar faces um, here. Um, I thought I would uh, just start with a summary of my, um, my current job, what I'm just a little more detail about what I'm doing, and uh, a little bit about career path, and, um, and then go, to, go into a few lessons that um, I've learned over the years that I, I'm, hope, I'm hoping will be helpful to, to some of you. Um, I was uh, sitting in many, you know, I was sitting probably in the back here um, when Ross Peterson was teaching History 170 in this room. And, and I remember walking in, you know, first class of the day and just being exhausted and just nervous and taking notes and leaving. And I, so this room brings back a lot of memories for me, although they're not usually like good memories. <laughs> but that was a great class, and, and I hope that this is at least somewhat useful for you. Um, first of all, I want to say I've never felt disadvantaged by uh, coming to Utah State. In fact, I've always felt a sense of pride in telling people that I graduated from USU. I, in my career, I've had, um, I've worked with people and had and reported to, to people uh, from uh, Bombay, New Delhi, Buenos Aires, from Brazil, Norway, New Zealand, the UK, Cuba, uh, Tokyo. Um, and I'm, today, I'm, I deal constantly with um, colleagues of mine in Europe, Latin America, and Asia. And in my experience, most people are not concerned about where you come from, but what you can do for them. And, and that's basically it. So, so much of it, of who you are, is is what you make of your experiences and, and the things you learn from them and how you develop your own skills. Um, as a quick summary of what I do, I'm on a fixed income trading floor at uh, Citigroup Global, Global Markets. Um, when I'm in New York, I work on the trading floor and I'm here, I, I work um, my own little mini uh, trading floor in my house. Um, there are about 800 people on the trading floor in New York. Um, most people think of trading like the, you know, like the New York Stock Exchange or like the movie Trading Places or something. But it's not like that at all. It's, it's, it's a very, uh, it's a big trading floor with a lot of rows and people on phones. And most of our trades are done over the phone um, and in dealings with people face to face there on the floor. Uh, the best way to think about trading is like any other franchise business. Um, a trader is really a mini entrepreneur sitting on the desk. Uh, of Citigroup in this case. Trader is given a small fraction of the balance sheet to, to, to work with and a specific mandate. In my case, it was to structure and trade derivatives on bonds issued out of Latin America. So I use the balance sheet in, any, in whatever way I think is best within my constraints in order to make money for my firm. Uh, in the simplest form, I buy, I buy Latin American bonds. I repackage them into a form that's easier and cheaper for our customers to buy than if they were to do it directly. Um, I use a global distribution network um, that spans retail investors and high net worth investors, institutional investors in every major region of the world, Latin America, New York, London, um, and Asia. <clears throat> I ha and I pay these distribution outlets for, for what they do for me. I have dedicated legal, operational, tax, accounting, technical, and management support that I can, that I can go to when I need help. Uh, and I know with precision every day um, how much money I've made or lost at the end of the day. Um, and I get paid a percentage of, um, of what I make, um, a very kind of loose way. Um, so in many ways, it's an entrepreneurial type position. And I think any job can be viewed that way. Um, but that's what I love about trading. You, you can walk in with, um, walk in the, in the door every day with an opportunity to make, to make money based on helping, helping your customers with what they need and um, putting trades on the, on the balance sheet for your own firm and making money that way also. Uh, the environment is stimulating. There's a high degree of autonomy. And I put here you get paid much more than you really should, which is, which is probably true. Uh, my career path, I started at Utah State in 1980. Um, I, I was raised in, in Logan, attended Logan High. Um, as the dean mentioned, I'd really, uh, liberal, liberal, I was a liberal studies major, which is really not a major. It's, it's, it's the major they give you if you don't know what you're going to do. 
with your life. So my counselor told me when I started. Um, I served a mission for the LDS Church in, tai in Taiwan. Um, it was really my first experience outside of Cache Valley. It's extremely stimulating for me. And that was the thing of probably the, the formative experience uh, of uh, my early life that really exposed me to life outside of Cache Valley. Um, as the Dean mentioned, I, I served an internship um, in my sophomore year for Jim Hansen in Washington, D.C. Um, that was also a great experience for me. It was three months only, but it was probably, again, it just it reinforced my desire to be um, sort of in an urban environment in a big city in the middle of where things are, are happening. Um, I enjoyed the internship so much that I stayed on in, in Washington for the summer I tried to. I uh, shared a, a, an apartment with a group of students from Georgetown, and I, I worked as a temp um, trying to support myself. So typing skills, like for me, were actually crucial for me to support my, myself uh, for a little while. Um, then I worked at IBM in Rochester, New York for six months. Um, and USU gave me credit for my, my time at, at, in IBM. Um, and then I returned to Utah State. Um, midway through my junior year to finish up my studies. So I, sp I spent about a year during college um, just working and getting uh, college credit for it, which was great. Um, when I applied to Harvard Business School in my senior year, and I was not expecting at all to get accepted. I, I had a bunch of backup plans, and um, uh, you know I worked hard to, on the GMAT and everything else to, to get admitted to business school. I really didn't know if this was what I wanted to do, but I felt like it was the, the logical option at that point. It, it was like the, the next step that seemed to make sense to me. Um, and sh it was shocked to get accepted, fr frankly. Um, but I was also extremely excited about it. And um, that, to me, was kind of the door that meant that I was going the right way and that this was what I was uh, supposed to do. Um, when I, uh, I needed to get a job for a couple years um, after after graduating from Utah State because I had this two-year gap between uh, USU and business school. So I began by searching in New York City. And that's only because that, so that's where most of the jobs seemed to be at the time. And uh, late, this was in 86, 88, and things were going pretty well in New York at the time. Like the, the financial markets were, were, this was the was kind of the booming 80s. So there were a lot of people going to New York at the time in finance. Um, but I didn't, I didn't realize at the time that I was also following a, a well-worn path. So many people from across America and across the world who, who continue to be attracted to New York. Um, I managed getting a job uh, at Citibank as an analyst um, in the chemicals department of Citibank, which is a department that covers the largest uh, chemical companies in the world. So my wife and I moved to New York um, two weeks after, or about a month after graduating from Utah State, and about two weeks after getting married, and, um, and we ended up in a tiny studio apartment in on uh, 56th Street in, in Manhattan, which is now, which we later learned is called Hell's Kitchen, you know, for a reason. Um, so our first week in New York. Um, we watched the news coverage of a former mental patient who had slashed a, bu uh, slashed a bunch of people on the Staten Island Ferry with a machete. And we wondered what we were doing living in New York. But opportunities always come with challenges. And, and that leads to my first point, which is go where there is opportunity. Um, there's a wonderful essay written by E.B. White called Here is New York. And I want to just read a couple of, uh, really just one paragraph of this. The residents of Manhattan are to a large extent strangers who have pulled up stakes somewhere and come to town seeking sanctuary or fulfillment or some greater or lesser grail. The capacity to make such dubious gifts is the mysterious quality of New York. It can destroy an individual or fulfill him depending a good deal on luck. No one should come to New York to live unless he's willing to be lucky. There, there are roughly three New Yorks. First, there's, there's the New York of the man or woman who was born here who takes the city for granted. Second, there's the New York of the commuter. Third, there's the New York of the person who was born somewhere else and came to New York in quest of something. Of these tr three trembling cities, the greatest is the, is the last, the city of final destination, the city, the city that is the goal. 
It is this third, this third city that accounts for New York's high-strung disposition, its poetical deportment, its dedication to the arts, and its incomparable achievements. And whether it is the farmer arriving from Italy to set up a small grocery store in a slum, or a young girl arriving from a small town in Mississippi to escape the indignity of being, being observed by your neighbors, or a boy arriving from the Corn Belt with a manuscript in his briefcase and a pain in his heart, it makes no difference. Each embraces New York with the intense excitement of first love. That's a close quote. New York is really just a metaphor for any other big city or new opportunity. It could, could just as well be Chicago, San Francisco, London, Salt Lake City, Sao Paulo, or, or Shanghai. Alternately, alternatively, something close to home, but a, a livelihood that pulls you and stretches you. The common theme is leaving home and school and the things that make you feel safe and comfortable and going out to claim your fortune. So go where there is opportunity. Second point is be willing to bet on yourself and your own abilities. Uh, after two years in New York and two more at business school, I returned to New York, the Citibank, to start my, my real career. I spent six months in traditional and commercial banking there and then moved into the derivatives product group where I joined a small group of three people working on structuring new products. It was really just a, a new products area. They, their, their goal was to develop some new product. They didn't know what it was going to be. Um, I ended up being very, we ended up being very successful in emerging markets. And then I, after two years of that, I got a call from a trader at Solomon Brothers who asked me to meet with him about joining the new emerging markets desk there. The position at Solomon was a trading position, which I had never done before. And it was also much more quantitative in nature than I was used to. I remember, I was a liberal arts major at Utah State, not engineering, you know, not economics. So I, I didn't, and I'd been to business school, but frankly didn't feel that comfortable with a highly quantitative position. My, my boss was going to be a senior trader at Solomon in approximately 10 years in the business, who was a Princeton PhD. During my job interview, he asked me how, how I would delta hedge an option on a, on, a, on a Mexican par bond. And I had no idea what he was talking about, <laughs> frankly. Somehow, I was offered the job anyway, so, so then I had a decision to make. Uh, first of all, leaving a group of people at Citibank who liked me and had sponsored my career for the last four years to join a group who, I, who had no idea of who I was or what I could do. Going to a trading desk, which demanded quantitative skills that I did not have, joining a firm that did not have the reputation as the best work environment. My Citibank manager had told me point blank at that point that I would not last at Solomon. I, I read the book Liar's Poker by Michael Lewis, if any of you have read it. Um, if I had read the book, you know, if, I'd waited, if I had not waited to read the book until the night before I joined Solomon, I, I probably would not have gone. But on the positive side, I had a chance to work with a small group of highly talented people. I had the chance to learn about trading, especially derivative trading, which um, was a, a rare opportunity, I, I felt. And I had a chance to push myself way out on the risk-return curve, taking a lot more risk from, my, from a career perspective, but also um, having the potential for higher uh, compensation. Um, one of my bosses at the time told me you should always be willing to take a bet on yourself. So I decided to, to leave. And it was probably the single best decision um, career-wise that I, that I have made. There's an old adage that says, fortune favors the bold. And good things generally happen when you have the courage to move ahead boldly, even if the outcome is not, is not exactly what you expected it to be. Usually, it's something good. Uh, the third point is know what you don't know. I'm constantly telling this to young traders who join our desk. Know what you don't know. And most of the time, they have no idea what we're talking about, which is part of the problem. Um, in December 1994, I'd been, for, I'd been at Solomon for about 18 months. It was still a relatively junior uh, vice president derivatives trader. We, as a strategy, had tried to maintain was called long volatility trading positions, which means if you have volatility, you make money. If you're short volatility and things get volatile, you generally lose money. And in emerging markets, things were generally more volatile than people expected them to be. So we ended up buying volatility cheaply and making money by trading it. 
At the time, I dreamed up a new product, which was going to be selling leveraged notes on, on Mexican peso, which would give us a long volatility position. And we started making money trading it. Then the Mexican government was forced to float the peso, which had been pegged to the dollar, uh, back in Christmas of 1994. Um, and suddenly my, my beautiful long volatility positions became short volatility positions because I didn't realize at the time or hadn't priced in, into the, tr the, the, the pricing of the transaction that when the, when the peso moved by that much, then suddenly my long volatility positions became short volatility positions. And this at a time when volatility was spiking up probably more than it ever had in the, in the mixed peso dollar um, FX rate. So all the assumptions that I had made about making money suddenly um, were down the drain. And I very quickly learned about the, the joys of trading short volatility in, uh, in a volatile market. So we lost $5 million over the course of the next two or three months trying to get ourselves out of these positions. And we probably only made about two or three hundred thousand dollars going into the positions. Um, it was not a fatal loss, but it was ugly enough to imprint on my mind that we must always be wary of thinking that things, of the thinking that something will never happen. Um, on our trading desk, we hire a new associate. We just hired a new associate out of the training program. She's very quantitative and she's very sharp. We gave her the Argentina derivatives book to manage, and she's made money on it so far. It's only been about five months. Uh, but the fact that she's made money suddenly means that we can't tell her something, we can't tell her anything that she doesn't already know. So the best thing in the world that could happen to her and would be to anybody who's in that position would be to lose money and erase the sort of arrogance that comes along with making money, um, particularly with traders who are prematurely successful. Um, on a trading desk, arrogance is a, is a huge red flag. Um, famous rogue traders like Nick Leeson who single-handedly brought down bearings, and more, le more recently, Jerome Curviel from uh, uh, Sockgen, who lost $7 billion a couple months ago, both thought that they knew more than the market. Experienced, wise traders will always be willing to say, I don't know, and will seek advice and counsel from, from the smart people around them. Pretending to know what you don't really know or, pre or pretending to know the unknowable can be fatal weaknesses in trading. A related point about trading, the trader has the ability to commit his institution simply by saying that a trade is done verbally on the phone or or face to face with somebody. Your reputation is made in small ways every day and can be destroyed by a single act of fraud or dishonesty. Most traders learn very quickly that there is only downside in dishonest or unethical behavior. You basically you're shown the door almost immediately and Typically, if, you're, if it's really fraudulent and egregious, you'll, you'll face legal action. So as a trader, knowing what you don't know means thinking through and pricing correctly all possible outcomes of any particular trading strategy. At a personal level, it means that you do your homework. You don't plunge into risk that you don't under understand and haven't thought through. Remember that, that the unlikely may be more probable than you or most people think it is. And you also have a healthy respect for the unknown or what is unknowable. So know what you don't know. Uh, the fourth point, be smart with the money that you do have. I was managing risk positions in, on the Brazilian local bond market in the summer of 1997 as Russia devalued the ruble and defaulted on its local government T-bills, which led to the, the Asia, which, which became, a, of course, the Russia crisis. and led to the long-term capital management bailout here in the United States. This crisis forced me to take a hard look at my personal financial situation and I went through the following thought process. I was employed by a Wall Street firm, so my livelihood was directly exposed to the financial markets. My year-end bonus was dependent on my making good decisions in a very tricky trading environment, so I was exposing myself to financial risk every day. Uh, I had accumulated stock in Solomon Brothers over the years as part of my compensation. And uh, while it had been doing okay, I just allowed it to, to accumulate and not done anything with it. And I also had a mortgage um, on a house in Westchester County. So basically, every, every which way I was exposed to 
uh, financial risk of the of um, New York City area, um, the financial markets, or my own firm. It was, pain, it was painfully obvious that I had to do something to reduce my, my personal risk. I continue to be astounded by colleagues of mine who don't try to diversify themselves when times are good, and in fact leverage themselves even more with vacation homes, yachts, and sports cars, etc. The New York Times noted last March 18th that some Bear Stearns executives, um, of course Bear Stearns recently um, went under and was bought out by J.P. Morgan, um, some Bear Stearns executives, their life savings depleted and faced with a situation they had thought almost impossible, had moved quickly the weekend before their firm was bought out by J.P. Morgan to put their weekend homes on the market. A few weeks ago, a, a web link circulated of an Australian investor fire selling a $350,000 Porsche to make a margin call. Um, Many students start out their careers with significant debt. I, I myself graduated with a lot of debt when I came out of, of business school. And paying it off was a huge distraction for me. But paying off debt, and especially consumer debt, is by far the best investment that you can make from a risk return standpoint. It's impossible to find an investment that's better than, better than paying off debt. It's AAA rated because you, you're guaranteed to get the return. It carries an after-tax return of whatever your interest rate is, six, seven, or eight, or 10 percent, and there's no interest rate risk on the, on the investment at all. If you're a trader and you saw an investment like that, you would pile into it as, <laughs> as much as you could. Um, and that's what you get when you pay off debt. Just think about debt like any other investment. So be smart with your money. Uh, fifth point, success doesn't always mean happiness. When I was an analyst at Citibank, I was put on a deal team to structure a very large syndicated loan for IMC, the fertilizer company. It was my first experience with all-nighters at work, and it was not pleasant for me. I would guess I slept maybe three or four hours over a four or five day period. It was, it was interesting at times and fun at times, but also exhausting and also unsettling for me because I felt like I lacked control over my life. And finance can be this way in some, in some jobs. Trading as compared to investment banking, I found is much more manageable from a personal, st a personal time standpoint. It's quite intense during market hours, but then the market closes and you go home. And you typically don't work on the weekends. But still, work has a tendency to creep into, into the evenings and some nights and weekends. At one point in my career, um, as we, my wife and I started having children and we had increasing responsibilities outside of work, um, it was clear to me that things were becoming unmanageable. So I just made the conscious decision to start leaving earlier, just kind of just leaving. And um, I tried to be a lot more efficient while I was at my job. It definitely had a, an impact um, on my career, but it was worth a trade-off, and I think it also established some boundaries for me and for the people that I worked with that I found very useful. Ultimately, work has to be a means to an end only, and there's always the danger that it becomes the end in itself. Kim Clark, who is a former dean of, of Harvard Business School, told a group of us business school students when we were attending to be aware of something he called the lore of the inner circle. And this he interpreted, I interpreted this to mean that sometimes we get drawn into living by the unwritten creed of, of whatever institution we're working for that begins to place work considerations above everything else. In the spring of 2007, Chuck Prince, who's the former chairman and CEO of Citigroup, was fielding questions from a group of NYU business school students and was asked, the question, how do you manage to maintain any kind of balance between life and work? Chuck Prince says, I'm going to give you a serious answer because it's a very serious question. I've spent my entire life as a workaholic. I don't mince words about that. It really destroyed my first marriage. Happily, it did not impact the relationship with my two kids. So I'm not a good person to advise, even in hindsight, on how to do it differently. This is kind of a typical response that you'd hear, actually, from uh, people in senior executive positions who are honest about, uh, about 
the, the impact that, that some of these jobs can have on, your pers on, a, on, a, on, on someone's personal life. Chuck Prince became one of the early victims of the recent credit crisis, resigning from Citigroup last fall after our firm reported a huge write-down related to, to subprime exposure on its balance sheet. So at the end of the day, it didn't matter um, that he reached that position um, and sacrificed so much um, for it. The story is told by, by Warren Buffett, the, re the legendary investor of an elderly, elderly lady he met in Omaha, Nebraska, a Polish Jew who had spent years in a concentration camp during the Second World War. She said to him, Warren, I am very careful about making friends. When I meet a potential friend, I always ask myself, would they hide me? If you get to be 75 and have lots of people who would hide you, you're a success. That's really the test and you can't buy it. And Warren Buffett replied by saying, I know, I know people whose own kids wouldn't hide them. They'd be yelling, they'd be yelling he's in the attic, he's in the attic. <laughs> it's a typical response. I'm certainly no expert here, but I've learned enough to know that relationships are more valuable than money. So Trade-offs are, inevit are, are inevitable between life and, per and work. But the best long-term investment is in personal relationships and not in work as the be-all and end-all of existence. Uh, six, six point um, that I had is keep your head down and, and stay positive. In the summer of 2001, we were trading the Brazilian government bond market and it was under, under severe stress. I was carrying a relatively tiny position in Brazilian government bonds, about 100 million US dollar value in one month bonds, which meant very low interest rate risk. But then suddenly, one month interest rates jumped from 8% to 50%. And we got stopped out of our position and we lost our entire, year, our, our entire year's worth of P&L. This is eight months into the year and you get paid at the end of the year. So we knew that we didn't have, we knew that we were, we were not going to get paid very much that year. It was very discouraging for us um, on our desk. Um, but we made a decision to keep our heads down and, and, uh, and go to work. And it's amazing what happens when you ignore the past and start living in the moment and working in the moment. We discovered that the bid offer spreads on our business has suddenly widened dramatically, which meant we could make a lot more money by doing volume. And the high level of interest rates meant that we would do a lot more volume because we had customers suddenly interested in 50% interest rates as opposed to the 8% that existed prior to the crisis. So, we made all of our money back and then some by year end in the last four months. And we set, up, we set ourselves up for a record year in, 2000, in, the, in the following year in 2002. The key was really staying positive and, and continuing to look for opportunities when things are going wrong. You cannot control events, but, you can, but if you keep your wits about you, you can profit from them. To paraphrase Nicholas Taleb, who's the author of uh, the bestseller, The Black Swan, America's primary export is trial and error and the innovative knowledge obtained in such a way. Trial and error has error in it. And the most top-down, traditional, rational, and academic environments do not like the fallibility of error and the embarrassment of not quite knowing where you're going. The U.S. fosters entrepreneurs and creators, not exam takers or bureaucrats. So the perceived weakness of the American pupil in conventional studies is where her, his or her very strength may lie. The American system of trial and error produces doers, dream, ch dream chasing entrepreneurs with a tolerance for a certain class of risk taking and for making plenty of small errors on the road to success or knowledge. Globalization allows the U.S. to specialize in the creative aspect of things, the risk taking production of concepts and ideas in which more income, more income can be generated from the same fixed assets through innovation. By exporting jobs, the U.S. has outs outsourced the less scalable components of production and assign them to citizens of more mathematical and, and culturally rigid states who are happy to be paid by the hour to work on other people's ideas. Um, he makes the final point, we need to make our own luck. We can be scared or worried about the future or we can look at it as a collection of happy surprises that lie outside the path of our imagination. I truly believe that the future is something to be optimistic about. We've been living through, in, our, in my job, we've been living through 
probably the worst crisis that um, I have ever seen. Um, I saw a bunch of crises on smaller scale in, in um, Argentina when they defaulted on their own debt, on Brazil when they almost, um, almost defaulted on their own debt, their, their, their local debt. Um, in Mexico, when they devalued the currency and, and uh, almost um, caused a chain reaction that would have uh, caused some Wall Street firms to default. And I've had a great front row seat in the last couple months um, watching Bear Stearns go under and watching um, something in our modern day we haven't seen, uh, you know, run on the bank. And I joined when I, when I started my career in finance, it was 1991. That was not a good time to start in finance. I, I joined Citibank in 1990. In 1991, the stock price of Citibank was at $5 a share uh, and going down. And it was, the bank was technically insolvent because of, of LDC debt and uh, commercial real estate debt that had, that had basically gone, gone under. Um, so it was probably, a, it could have, I could have viewed it as the worst possible time to join or the best possible time. And in my view, it was really probably the best possible time. Um, and there are opportunities, I think, being created today in the markets that, are, that will not be seen for a long time. And um, so I, I think it's, it's, it's important to remember that staying positive and, and keeping your wits about you in difficult environments can only, can only um, first of all, makes your life much easier and it also makes your life um, m much more successful. So um, in summary, go where there is opportunity. Be willing to bet on yourself. Know what you don't know. Be wise with your financial assets. Don't confuse money with uh, success with happiness. And keep your head down and stay positive. And that's it. And thank you very much. Um, <laughs>